I'm all good. Thank you, Liv. Thanks, everybody, for coming, and thanks to everybody who is joining us online. We are here at Stone & Chalk in Sydney, and we are here at the Web3 Innovation Center. We'll tell you all about that in just a minute. First, I do want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. We are in Gadigal country and the Eora Nation, and I would like to acknowledge the elders past, present, emerging, and extend that welcome to any First Nations people or Torres Island Strait uh, nationals who may be joining us, either here in the room or online. So we're here today to talk about, oh, not the knowledge of country, Web3, which I'm assuming everybody here has some idea about, or you probably wouldn't be here. What we're talking about today is the future of business in a Web3 world. But first, I want to introduce you to our Web3 Innovation Center and what that means. So in conjunction with the Australian DeFi Association, Stone & Chalk has started to put together a community of Web3 innovators who are going to help take us to that next level. We are working with all of our hubs, Sydney. We have two hubs in Sydney. We have Melbourne. We have Adelaide. And this community is open to anybody in all those regions. And as we expand our uh, footprint into other places, they'll be welcome there as well. So we're excited to introduce everybody to the world, wide world of Web3 and the world of Stone and Chalk. Putting the two things together gives everybody, we think, the best chance to succeed. And the best chance to succeed means the best chance to innovate and to create the new future. So we've got a, a panel today to talk to you a little bit about what's going on and what not only the Web3 Innovation Center means, but also what, what is happening outside of that center right now at places like NAB uh, and what's happening in the rest of the world as well. And we're interested in talking a little bit about what the possible future might look like. So that's what our panel is going to be about today. And we're going to talk a little bit about what our panelists think, but we're also going to get your views as well. There will be questions and answers. There is a Slido app. Yeah, that's us. We'll get to it. There is a Slido um, QR code. Feel free to grab a snap of that and ask some questions. Now, we're going to try to get as many of the questions in through Slido as possible. And I've been warned not to try to take too many questions from the crowd, but I'm going to do that anyway. So we're going to try to keep this as interactive and as fun as possible. This is not about a presentation to you guys. This is about a discussion and discourse about the future of business in a Web3 world. And that's really a, an open question. So there's no answers here today, but there's lots of discussion to be had. So I'm really excited about that. And I would like to present, we can go back the slide, who our panel is here to talk about that with us today. So we've got Kate Cooper from NAB. And Kate, I'd like to give you a couple of seconds to introduce yourself. Yeah, awesome. This is working good. Uh, so yeah, Kate Cooper, I am um, the executive leading digital assets at NAB. I've been at NAB for um, about two years, and prior to that, I worked at Westpac, where I was leading innovation across the group. Um, I live in Tassie um, and grew up in London, hence the accent. Don't get confused. And prior, so prior to moving to Australia, um, ran my own business um, so have kind of done the startup thing as well for seven years before exiting in 2015. So I've been on both sides of the journey, both as an entrepreneur myself, albeit not in the Web3 space, um, but now um, represent the corporate world. Don't hate me. <laughs> and Mark Monfort, who joins us from the Oz DeFi Association and Not Centralized. Mark? Thanks, Michael. Uh, so this is a bit weird because I'm used to being the moderator for events like this. So uh, hands up, yes, <laughs> hands up who knows the OzDefi Association or is a part of it or has been coming to the events. That's awesome for the people that had their hands down. Look to the person that put their hands up so you can learn more about it. Um, but as Michael said, the Web3 Innovation Center, that is something that we partner with. Stone & Chalk is the home of innovation in Australia. And, uh, you know, with FinTech Australia, RegTech Australia, other associations, it made sense that Web3 was a natural next step. Um, I'm wearing a shirt with a big NC logo uh, on here that was not designed by Midjourney or Dali, um, <laughs> but in PowerPoint, believe it or not. 
uh, but Not Centralized does a few things, one of them being community engagement, and we created this AusDefi Association because we wanted to engage with the groundswell of community members and complement the other associations out there like Blockchain Australia, Blockchain City, etc. Um, but we also do product development, so we talk about the cool things that we're building for customers as well as tools we're creating ourselves in the blockchain space. And then we also do things like capital raising. So anything I say here is financial advice and legal advice. Kidding. So yeah, <laughs> take that note. They did not immediately respond to that one. No, they they no, were looking no. for that. It's not my normal as DeFi crowd. Everyone laughs, laughs at my jokes there. So that's the key. You laugh. At... No, I'm just joking. Just in general, when Mark speaks, laugh. Uh, one last thing I want to say is this is going out across the country. This is going to our other hubs. This is a national event. One of generally four a year that we run. The idea here at Stone and Chalk is to make sure that we connect the communities together. We're, we're, a, we're really here to be that connection in the ecosystem. And we'd like to build ecosystems and put people together. We've, we met the guys at OzDefi and exactly the same idea. So we came together and said, well, let's do this together. And you can see what the response is here. I think our next uh, event is coming up in June, Blake? July, so close. Uh, and that one's going to be on AI. I know that's not a very topical conversation to have, but um, we'll ask ChatGP to figure out something to say. I've, I've got ChatGPT on my phone telling me exactly what to say. So, <laughs> so with that, we're going to get right into it. You might want to answer that phone, whoever that was. Uh, it's mom. <laughs> so just to, just to sort of set the stage a little bit, uh, Web3 technology, as we all know, has already had an influence throughout the world. And the question is, you know, what, what influence will it continue to have? There are practical applications in everything from insurance to gaming to finance, obviously, and payments. And the question I have is, how is Australia contributing to the development of the adoption of Web3 technologies compared to the rest of the world? Let's start with you, Kate. Yeah, so I think um, it's fair to say that we're definitely, you know, one of the kind of emerging crypto hubs um, globally, which is something that I think I'm really proud of. And those who are working in the space alongside me should be really proud of. And I think there's a few factors that are, um, I guess, contributing to that. I think, first of all, um, the kind of regulatory engagement with the space. Um, the regulators are really starting to come to the party. Um, given the volatility in the market over the last 18 months, we feel strongly as NAB that we're welcoming of their involvement, their guidance, um, and some direction around um, how digital assets will be treated moving forward. And so the fact that there's a healthy dialogue, a very active dialogue um, with them, I think is a contributing factor. Certainly, if I compare it to some of the other jurisdictions we have exposure to, okay, maybe we're not quite as, as advanced as Singapore in that regard, but certainly, you know, we've got an active community. Um, obviously, there's been the RBA CBD pilot, which I think you're much better placed to talk to than I am. Um, NAB's definitely participating from a sandbox perspective, but not in this first round of use cases. But it's definitely an indicator of the extent to which, you know, we as a, um, as a crypto hub or crypto nation, whatever you want to call it, um, are kind of contributing to that kind of global narrative. Um, and obviously, I would say this, but, you know, there's major banks participating. Um, only today there was press announcement from uh, the Blue Bank down the road from us. Um, and you will have seen more um, recently, we've launched our own stable coin. And I think, and we'll come on, I'm sure, to talk about this, um, but the role for... Um, banks to play in the space I think is significant. Um, I think it's all still to play out, but I think the fact that we're coming to the party and really investing is part of that building of Australia as a kind of crypto nation. And I guess last but not least, and I think this one's a bit controversial, is the idea around talent. So, you know, we always talk in Australia about a dearth of talent across um, tech sector, and that's definitely something that we struggle with in terms of you know, getting the right talent. But I do think there are little pockets now of expertise in this space that we're starting to build some muscle in. That talent is in huge demand globally. And so I think it's incumbent on all of us who are working in the space to continue to foster and invest on that talent, because I think that will be the pathway that leads us to be successful moving forward. Thanks, Kate. And so we've heard about 
the almost decentralized finance perspective. Yep. But we also know that one of the big, big plays for Web3 is decentralized finance. And Mark, that's your specialty. Where do we sit globally with DeFi? Uh, we, we're doing quite a lot of things here in Australia um, around just take away the technology. Australia has always been a home for experimentation. Big global firms can come to Australia. It's a Western country. Um, far away, and you know, we, we are far away, so that kind of makes it hard sometimes, but it's far enough away to not be exposed to some of the macro uh, kind of things that go on, say, in the US and, and Europe. But the big experimentation factor there means that um, a lot of people can and businesses can come here and be safe in the assurance that what you try out here in Australia, if it does work and you do get traction and get clients, it is much easier to share that across uh, the globe. And because it is decentralized just by the very nature of it, you don't have to have these teams that all sit in the one space. You don't have to have technology that is I need my service here in this one country, et cetera. Um, now that does get into legal and other kind of ramifications, but the decentralized kind of finance space, what we're starting to see more is that corporates, as well as the uh, very lower end kind of startups, one, two person shops, and, and even uh, around that size, they're starting to come together and figure out how can they take advantage of the manpower, um, that the strength that comes from having an open source community that is developing far faster than you would have anything that you could do as an individual company, whether you're a bank or something else. I mean, JP Morgan, for example, one of the biggest banks in the world, last time I checked, that was before Silicon Valley and all the Credit Suisse stuff, but um, I'm, you know, they're still big. But uh, they initially wanted to go down the path of a private blockchain right? Because they're a bank, secrets, we need that. We need to have something like that in terms of privacy, and we'll touch on that in the talk. However, what they realized was that the development space, they can't keep up to pace with the development. So they found a way to use an open source blockchain like Polygon, well, like it is Polygon, and having a way to still do their private stuff, but on an open source chain that means that they can take advantage of the developer push and resources and stuff there. And here in Australia, you know, apart from um, the stuff that, that Kate has mentioned, that the government and, you know, not just this experimentation, rather, because people don't realise, they we could have just had a government that says, you're going to have a CBDC whether you like it or not, like other countries are trying to do. Australia is not doing that. They are talking to us. They are talking to developers. Sometimes you have even regulators coming into this room or joining us online. They're hidden in plain sight, but and there's good reasons why they can't just say who they are per se, but they are part of this community. They're part of this group because they want to engage. They want to get educated. They want to make informed decisions rather than not involving the community. And I think that is probably the greatest thing because without that, it would make it very, very difficult here in Australia to be a developer and to help other companies in that space. Okay. Can I add something? I think just to echo your, your point. Please. So those of you who saw the press around our launch for Stablecoin, we have launched on a public permissionless chain, Ethereum. And that was a, exactly a very deliberate and actually quite bold decision. If you'd seen some of the conversations we've had to have internally in order to get to that point, um, they're really quite challenging. But one of the key reasons was the access to the resilience provided by the network of talent globally. Um, and, you know, when you start to think about, you know, a, a future scalable solution, a public system, def a private system definitely is perhaps an easy short term route, definitely has its benefits. But that kind of public um, permissionless space really allows us to tap into talent we otherwise never would do. So that's our nod to decentralized. <laughs> Fantastic. So in one sentence. The answer to the question, how do we compare to the rest of the world? Are we leading, are we lagging, or are we following? Punching above our weight. Mark? We are really good. <laughs> <laughs> it's decentralized. We're defying. We, you know, one word, I'll give you five. That's right. I didn't say one word. I said one sentence. So you, so you actually I don't comply. listen either. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Even when you're trying not to, you do. Uh, so that's great. So... Next discussion I want to talk about, before we get into tech, we'll get into that, because that's what we do. But I want to talk a little bit about the, the philosophical implications for a minute of what, what Web3 can do. 
The whole idea at core, Web3 is about decentralization. It's about creating um, a, a trust mechanism that doesn't require uh, a, a middleman, so to speak. It creates transparency. It creates uh, levels of interactions with data that should be more trustworthy. That's at the heart. The question I have then is, as we do this, does this raise interesting questions for you? And it'd be really interesting to hear how you think about this, Kate, around the nature of power, control, and trust in the world we play in, considering that's the central role of a bank throughout history to date. Is that an existential crisis for you? Uh, it could be in, at some point in the future. Um, and, you know, certainly the conversations we've had internally with senior stakeholders is what does the world look like in 10 years' time if the most extreme form of decentralized finance manifests? And I think all of us would agree that probably would be an existential crisis for, for banks. But I think that the last 18 months has seen us um, have a more nuanced understanding of the way that this is likely to mature and develop. And I think the volatility we've seen, the high profile collapses we've seen have actually proven the case for, um, you know, kind of centralized organizations like NAB, like banks participating. Um, and we're still feeling our way. I always come to this conversation with enormous humility because we don't sit there pretending to have all the answers. I often say to our team that it's like we're in 2005 building the app store before the iPhone existed. And that's very much how it feels day to day working in a bank in this space. Um, but I think that, um, you know, yes, the, you know, trust nature of distributed ledger technology absolutely is part of the core tenets of why it's being adopted but the role that traditional organizations have in helping to fulfill on that potential I think is really important um, and is something that we're working really hard to understand what's our right to play what's our right to win in this space such that we can operate as a constructive part of the ecosystem um, not as kind of big brother um, looking down on a decentralized world which I just don't think is where the future's going. So Mark given that context talk to me about what trust and trustedness means to you in a decentralized world. Uh, what's really interesting in this space is that with regards to trust once you look at and understand what the core tenets of blockchain are uh, the security layer because it's decentralized so you've got more vectors that you know it's not just centralized and you just attack one section um, the transparency and uh, how it lowers barriers because we've got really easy to use ways of building things that were really difficult in traditional finance because of the open source nature the easier value transfer and all of these components um, you, you look at the real world and you see the ones and zeros of the matrix and you start to understand that the real world system, we are built on trust from the caveman days and whatever we were before in the primordial ooze. Um, we have very early on and even up until now been building a society based on trust. And what that means is like right now, uh, as a consultant, for example, wearing that hat, I'll do a bit of work for 30 days or so, end of the month, I'll invoice, I'll expect to get paid some point within that next 30 days. Now, you don't know if the other side is actually going to pay you, right? You don't know if there's going to be further delays. You would rather know and not have done the work and not have allocated resources or had a discussion before you'd put resources to waste. We're seeing it in the building industry, and it's part of why we're trying to help solve a problem with the RBA for that particular industry. But even without that pilot project, it's something that we just want to solve anyway. Now, imagine that you have with blockchain tech that ability to have a protocol where a payment can be made and some or an agreement can be made first of all with some sort of collateral that needs to be put up and once both sides see that that's there as an NFT and NFTs don't just have to be these pretty or not so pretty depending on your your style JPEGs right they don't just have to be the art but they can actually be invoices they can actually be these digital tickets they can be something where you can see much more about and have the, that transparency there about what is going on in the way that you're conducting commerce but trustless means that we have code that governs how things are done. Uh, another thing that you have with Trustless is that, like right now in the real world, 
if the government has a law or if the financial AF, you have an AFSL, you've got a license uh, to do some sort of, say, ETF, uh, and you're not supposed to sell that particular ETF to a certain type of retail customer. You can only sell it to wholesale or whatever it is. Right now, you just have to have trust that these entities are not going to do the wrong thing. And if they do the wrong thing, we have courts and arbitration. Well, in a blockchain world, you actually have smart contracts where you don't have to rely on that. They, they are KYC'd or they're sanctioned. And if they're not supposed to be able to be sold to, it just doesn't happen. So it makes you rethink. There is this philosophical thing. You know, we've got uh, natural laws like gravity, um, if you don't believe in a flat earth. Uh, you've got gravity, right? And you've got these other natural laws. And then we've got all these man-made laws. By having the blockchain there, we start to delve into that world where we can actually make laws that are man-made, that are enforceable by code, not just man-made and trust me, bro. So it really breaks down how you think about um, the ways we engage in commerce, the ways we engage with each other, because it's not just about transferring value, but it's anything that we're doing in the world could be affected by blockchain and ChatGPT. <laughs> 45 minutes before we got a chat GPT reference. Well done. Uh, so look, we know, we know Web3 and the blockchain can solve a lot of problems. We know it's playing a huge role in a lot of industries we talked about, decentralized finance, payments, supply chain, uh, voting systems, and we talked about even gaming and insurance. There's a whole world out there where blockchain and Web3 will have a huge impact. But it's not a silver bullet. Right? It's not going to solve all of our problems for everything, because at the core, it's still humans using a system and humans training a system. And we do have issues there, right? There are still issues and challenges around its scalability. There are questions about its sustainability from an energy use point of view. There are questions about um, all of the humans who interact with the system and how it gets trained. There, these are all vulnerabilities. So with all that in mind, there are maximalists out there who think we should decentralize everything as far as possible. I'm not saying that's you, but we'll find out in a minute. And putting others in charge to, to create these uh, decentralized uh, systems to essentially replace human decision making in a lot of ways. Now, in a lot of ways, that's probably a good thing. But interested from the panel to hear, are we ready for that? Is this culture, is this society, is this planet ready to put trust? And I, and I think, okay, we've talked chat GBT, and so this is really in the news today, these days anyway. Are we ready to put our trust in a smart contract instead of a human? Are we ready to trust uh, a decentralized autonomous organization to do the right thing over a bank or over another institution? Kate, are we ready? No, definitely <laughs> okay, not. Okay, moving on. No, I <laughs> <laughs> no, no, listen, no, we're on a journey, right? And, um, you know, certainly, look, I, I am not like a deep expert. I haven't been in the space since 2012, and I wasn't an early investor in Bitcoin, um, much to my husband's annoyance. Um, but so, so for me, when I started to foray into this space, um, I found it really hard. Like I, you know, download my MetaMask, and I tried to, you know, deposit money in and I tried to move stuff around and didn't really understand what keys were, certainly did not understand what a hot, cold or warm wallet was. Um, I, I, honestly, I had to Google it. Um, I was just completely, you know, clueless. And what that strikes me as is the user experience within the space is still incredibly um, clunky. It's a hugely high barrier to, barrier to entry. And um, that idea of us being ready as a, as a people, I think, is predicated by us being able to test, learn, and experiment with it. And I think at the moment, the tech um, and especially the front end elements are really, really challenging. And so I don't think we're going to see, you know, kind of any kind of mass adoption until that gets um solved for. Um, I think that from a regulatory point of view, whilst I was um, very positive about the regulators in my earlier comment, um, you know, we're not going to see kind of widespread use until we have clear parameters and guidelines. The institutions that are going to make this accessible 
to you know mum and dad investors are not going to be playing in the space until there's that clear regulatory guidelines within which to operate and so i think that that's kind of a key barrier um, and then, you know, the reality is, and all of us who work in the industry have to acknowledge that there are bad actors still in the space. Um, and all the time those bad actors are at play and are not being brought to account and not being dealt with is, I would say, uh, a big, um, you know, kind of barrier to, um, you know, kind of mass participation and mass adoption. Nevertheless, and it's not a totally negative viewpoint, otherwise I wouldn't have the job I have today, um, I think there are certain high friction, high value use cases that exist, especially from a NAB perspective in our corporate and institutional client base, where blockchain technology really does solve a real world problem. Um, and I think that certainly from our perspective, our goal is to build out capability that gives us optionality to participate as the market matures. So as customers um, of all types, whether they be, you know, business customers, SMEs, um, start to participate, then we will, we're aiming to be ready there to serve and provide value to the marketplace, um, but only when there's that real appetite to do it, and we're not seeing it yet. Feel free to disagree. Just before you do that, remember if you've got questions, hit up Slido. Before you answer the question, I, I gotta, you got to answer this one first. Okay. Yes or no, are you a maximalist? Or. <laughs> uh, I am totally not, walked into that. I am, I am not a maximalist at all, even though I go by the name Captain DeFi. Because um, everyone in Web3, you get a new nickname when you come into this space. So that's, that's the thing that they teach you. Uh, get on Twitter and Discord. That's really where it's at. And in our Discord, the Oz DeFi Discord, um, you can look up AUS DeFi on Twitter. You get the links or you go to DeFi.org.au. Sorry for the shill. Um, but in the Discord where there is this discussion group, very lively discussion group there, they're currently debating this. Uh, there is a concept of something called a decentralized autonomous organization. And everyone gets a vote and everyone has a token that uh, in, in different ways, whether it's the value of the token, the number of tokens that you've got or whatever it is, there are different things being experimented with. It's Governance 101 that's been happening over hundreds of years and many wars being fought over being rapidly digitized again. Now, I say I'm not a maximalist because uh, I'm pragmatic and I see a spectrum of uh, decentralization. So decentralized finance, which is what our association is, and much of the work that we focus on, is not just about the yield and the investment. It, it's about the technology and the tools at play and how these can um, give us, whether it's working with banks or other corporates or government, how do we actually make things more efficient in how we're doing things to do with commerce or with sharing value, etc. Now, on that note, um, there is a, a saying, and it comes from the world of data, which I've also come from as well. Um, so some people might understand this, but they say you want to denormalize, sorry, you want to normalize until it hurts and denormalize until it works. Um, you can look that up, but the concept in DeFi and CeFi, CeFi being centralized finance, is you want to decentralize until it hurts. Decentralize as much as possible in your organization, and then you centralize until it works. That should tell you a lot about, you know, the clunky UX and UI, um, the bad explanations about how things kind of work in this space. It, it is the best of both worlds approach. We do not see it, that it makes sense to just throw away what we've been doing and building up for hundreds of years in banking, even though there's a crisis going on and everyone hates debt all of a sudden. Well, debt made credit creation. Debt was actually good if used in the right way. We are so quick as a uh, space, especially in Web3, to just throw away what governments, what corporates have built up instead of looking at, okay, certain things don't work, we can improve that with blockchain tech. That's the middle ground path um, that I align with. It's like the, the yin, the yang. Um, but I am, it does not mean that I'm not a believer in DeFi. I'm a big believer in DeFi and the tech if used in the right way. All things in moderation, right? Exactly, except for alcohol, so. Yeah. <laughs> for now, just, just stay calm out there. So we've talked about all the effective and efficient uses, well, not all of them, for a lot of effective and efficient uses for, for Web3 capability. 
although we haven't talked about bank yet banking in the metaverse, but we'll, we'll hold off on that one. Uh, but one of the other promises of Web3 capability and technology is privacy. And there's nothing more topical in the world today than cybersecurity and privacy. Uh, another day, another hack, right? And it's getting to the point now with ChatGPT, so third reference, uh, is now it, it's an arms race to use open AI and, and generative AI to help decrypt uh, as well as encrypt. And so it becomes this war, this, this arms race between the good actors and the bad actors to try and get one up on each other. How can we use Web3, and I'll start with you, Kate, to help prevent, I, I mean, it's, this is the, the question in a bank, right? Identity fraud and other forms of cybersecurity risks and exposing uh, the private information of your customers while still creating a user experience people want to use. I mean, it's the billion dollar question, right? Like, I don't, I don't think yeah. I, I... Can you answer it for me so I can write it down? <laughs> I, don't, I definitely don't have the answer. Um, it's, a, um, it's a space that we're exploring at depth. Um, we find ourselves challenged with, as I mentioned earlier, the public and permissionless nature of blockchain, but the requirement to hold commercial confidentiality, customer privacy, um, et cetera, at, at kind of the heart of our business and what we do. And we observe that, as I mentioned earlier, the bad actors at play in the space and still continue to um, really uh, be at, I would say, 101 of how we use the technology to help us on that journey. Um, obviously, um, there's zero knowledge technology that allows us to kind of um, assert a certain amount of truth, but I still think that's very much in its infancy. Um, and um, it's something that we're testing, experimenting with, um, but don't have the answers yet. I wish I did have the answer, by the way. Um, but I do, and, and you know, I do think, you know, obviously from a banking point of view, the element around know your customer is really important, both in terms of the regulatory requirement, but also it's incumbent on us as banks um, to fundamentally know what's happening with the money that we're um, helping to distribute. And there's definitely work um, being done in, in the space. Um, and if I think about the consortium of banks that I speak to globally on this topic, it's something that we're all trying to solve for together. Together. So I'm really sorry, but I don't have a clear answer for you. I guess I won't retire then. <laughs> All right. What about you, Mark? Have you got the answer? Uh, I thought you might because, you know, Oz Cyber is part of Stone & Chalk, uh, another shill there. But, Thanks. you know, cybersecurity is a massive and important part of blockchain and many technologies, whether we're delving into quantum or just AI. Um, and I won't say... Ch no, I won't say it. I won't say it. Um, there's a drinking game after this if you ever watch the replay, so just keep an eye out for that. But y you mentioned the, um, the, the zero knowledge kind of proofs and stuff, and it is in its infancy, and it's, there's a lot of experience happening. And, and the zero knowledge proof, the, the idea behind it is that imagine you've got a license, you're going out to the pub, you get carded, and instead of them looking at the whole license, they can just either scan a QR code that just indicates to them that you are who you say you are and there's other credentials that have helped prove you that way in a cryptographic way or you only have to show part of uh, that license, that ID. So instead of having to show the whole thing like we do in a day-to-day -day sense where you do give up some privacy, uh, you don't necessarily have to do that with zero knowledge. Now, another part of this as well is that there are some levers to pull and uh, not centralised. We're delving into the discussion. So feel free to get involved um, in the meetups, the Discord, etc., or even online on Twitter and throw stuff at us on Twitter because it's just digital, so it's not going to hurt as much. Um, but... You've got three levers, effectively, and uh, Arturo here um, at the front, put your hand up, yep, is writing about this, which is security, transparency, and accessibility. And this trilemma of levers, if you pull too much on one, you lose a little bit on the other. So depending on the function, if it's in banking, maybe it's more higher levels of security, or you can be a gung-ho kind of bank and, uh, hey, we've, we've got more on this, but you're going to lose a little bit of security, uh, a la Silicon Valley Bank, for example. But 
thinking about all of these things together, what's really important is to understand the underlying tech, see how it really uh, applies, and just trying to figure out um, where does it actually make sense to go really full on the privacy lever versus uh, you know other things that you might be able to take advantage of. But I think because it is in its infancy, one of the first meetups that Arturo and I kind of spoke at um, when it was just us two as the founders, now we've got a bit of a bigger team here, um, we had something where we didn't actually know how to solve it. And we flat out said to the crowd that, look, here's some part that we're going to look into. We don't know yet. And the question and answer thing, we thought we were going to get holes poked in our presentation. No, it was the crowd being absolutely and overtly helpful. They really wanted to, as a community, figure out this thing together because they if you see someone else doing something and solving this problem in privacy, Others are going to want to take advantage of that. A lot of people build in open source here because you do get to uh, take advantage as a whole community rather than just being the single person fighting for something. You get to fight as a community. And um, there's a lot of other clever things going on in the space around privacy where, you know, in the future, we might not even need things like SIM cards, for example, because there can be software and there's a group we're working with called Tide Foundation. And Tide is looking at ways where you can have these... Uh, signatures and proofs where you don't necessarily have to centralize it because they shard it, they take it apart, scramble it, and it's only if you look at it in a certain way where you will have the key. But it means that if an organization is hacked, well, sure, you could hack the organization, but you're not able to actually find anything there because everything's taken apart. So there are really clever things in the community. And if we, we don't know, we're very open to say we don't know. And then as a community, try to figure it out. So let's test that a little bit. Just want to turn the camera figuratively this way for a second and ask who's got a really interesting use case in Web3 technology that they want to tell us about? Just throw it out here. Anybody? Educational accreditation on the blockchain. Brilliant. Educational accreditation on the blockchain. Say that three times fast. Anybody else? Soulbound tokens. Soulbound soul tokens. Ah, yes. Nice. Anyone Where it else? takes your soul. Yeah. <laughs> Pothole management. On the blockchain? Right, so you basically crowdsourcing pothole damage so that it can be fixed and then send the message. Yeah, fantastic. Who's over, what, what, oh, he's just scratching his head, sorry. Oh, head scratcher. One over there. Decentralized social media. Can you have a decentralized social media? Yeah, I guess you can. Awesome. So look, we'll, we'll get into some, oh, we got one more. I've opened the floodgates. So royalty scenarios. Right, so, so for music or other royalties, the ability to pay somebody in perpetuity for their IP uh, using the blockchain to to validate. Yes. Real estate yes, real estate vendor contracts. Fantastic. Yes, please. I want that. Yeah, we all want that one. <laughs> right now, I need it in Tasmania. <laughs> <laughs> one last one over here. Private money, dark power money. That sounds awesome. I think that should be a movie. Um, <laughs> I'll watch it. <laughs> yeah. Dark power. That's a, actually, that's my next band name. Uh, so, given all of that, we know NAB's doing some cool things with Stablecoin. We heard about that. We know you're also using blockchain technology in trade finance. There's a lot of experimentation going on in a lot of businesses around the country in places you might not know or might not have thought about. And there's, and we know all the stuff that we've just talked about and all the things that we've heard from the audience. I'd like to know from you two, besides the two I've already mentioned, I've already put you at a disadvantage, Kate, I apologize. What are some of the really interesting use cases in your business organization or in your, or that you've heard of using Web3 technology? 
that we haven't already heard about. I made it harder on purpose. Yeah, no, that's definitely hard because I can't talk about a lot of the ones that are happening under the hood that haven't been announced. But what I can talk about that you haven't mentioned <laughs> is um, it kind of bringing together two of our strategic priorities, which is um, obviously digital assets and, and the use of blockchain technology and um, climate. Um, and so we're very interested in use of blockchain technology to... Um, evidence um, verification of, um, you know, kind of green activities overall. Obviously, in our um, company, it's related at the moment to our green loans. Um, but we used a, a, and partnered with a, a NAB Ventures company called Jura, um, which we announced, I think, back in January, the pilot, um, to start on our journey to um, that kind of uh, credentialing from an ESG perspective, which actually has a whole raft of different use cases. So the other um, project that's linked to that and is something that we were kind of the founding fathers of, but um, now is owned by a consortium of banks, is Carbon Place, um, which is in essence a, a carbon marketplace um, and um, certainly we see a huge amount of crossover in the emerging space that is um, climate and management of climate and our journey to net zero. Um, and you'll see more from us in that space. I love that one. And I don't know if you've seen the news lately. There's new legislation passed to stop companies from greenwashing. So you've seen a lot of companies pull all their, uh, let's say, tenuous uh, arguments uh, for how green they've become or are becoming off their websites in the last few weeks, and you'll continue to see that. Validation and verification of actual decarbonization is a fantastic use yeah, of Yeah, and I think, because we're obviously Australia's largest business bank, and so we see it as incumbent to help our, our customers, not just our retail customers, to really um, go on that journey. So we're kind of hand in glove with those customers around how do we help them like genuinely showcase their credentials, help them on their journey um, to net zero and help them evidence it in a responsible and trusted way, which of course, as we talked about, is you know what blockchain technology enables. What about you, Mark? What specific uses have you seen or have used in your own business? I love them all um, to all my clients. These are not there. your children. <laughs> These Fine. are not your children. Uh, okay, I can choose a favorite. Great. Um, so in that case, look up something called Trade Flows and look up something called Layer C. So Trade Flows is the payments protocol that's in with the RBA pilot. Uh, that's the one we're doing. Uh, Layer C is that compliance built into the smart contracts. Um, so those two are first and foremost. But you know, mentioning client ones out there because that's that's our babies. That's the ones that we're working on day to day. But with the clients ones, um, very interesting things like. Web3 is supposed to be empowerment. It's, it's supposed to be about empowerment and owning your data because Web2, look, Web1 was decentralized. It was this wild west of Lycos and Ask Jeeves and all these things that the kids won't know anymore, just like books. Um, but you had this wild west and then eventually things got centralized. Social media came about. We had Instagram, Facebook and all those things that powered themselves off of your um, blood, sweat, and tears in creating some cool TikTok, right? Uh, so you're not owning your data. You are the product. We've all heard that. And Web3 is meant to, if done in the right way, empower people to have that data power back to be able to choose which websites actually use their, you know, um, track them and trace them and use the data that they're providing. Because if you knew that you were being rewarded for um, being tracked, maybe some people here would be very open to that and others wouldn't. The point is you've got choice. And so there's Verita out of South Australia doing really cool things there. There's another group that's new and upcoming, female founders uh, called Data Boss, and they're, they're really interesting there. And then so, so data empowering people and giving people that choice to monetize their data or not or to just be really private, I think is really interesting. And another one is using NFTs. And I can't say the company, but we're... Uh, hopefully be going to be soon partnering with a group that um, is a big uh, EV manufacturer and uh, doesn't start with T. So um, the idea there is that imagine that for a test drive or something, you immediately get some sort of NFT that tracks and you know counts the carbon credits you're creating just by like riding in the vehicle and stuff and being able to connect customers in ways this is an EV thing but like it doesn't have to be that it could be a restaurant it could be fashion it could be all those things but using NFTs 
in ways that you can incentivize and provide perks to people in ways that you haven't done before. So really excited about that power back to the people with data, as well as what NFTs can be seen more as rather than these pictures that are traded. Yeah, your, your comment about Web1 really reminded me of something else the kids don't know about these days. I don't know if anybody, raise your hand if you've read the Clue Train Manifesto. This goes way back. And the original concept, of course, was don't try to bring people to you. You go to where the market is. That is decentralization in a nutshell, right? And what we've done is the opposite in Web2. So, so we're back to first principles again, I guess. Uh, here comes the ARPANET. Um, this conversation is supposed to be about the future. And I admit, I think we've only talked about the present. So let's talk a little bit about what's next and what the future is. So what's a problem that we can't solve today that we might be able to solve with Web3 technologies in the future? Can I go first? Go, run it. Uh, I recommend, <laughs> this is strategic. Um, I am of the big belief that this is not Web3 alone and blockchain alone. It is a tool that will just be like the wheel, the steam engine and things like that. And yes, it's very powerful, but at the same time, it does not work alone. It needs to be provided in combination with AI, um, eventually with quantum computing, eventually with nanobots and what that can kind of do. Have a listen to a really, look up a guy named Charles Hoskinson. He's one of the big blockchain founders um, out there and stuff. And uh, some people might find him very, you know, uh, they, they might be anti him. But like, if you just take away um, the things that you might not agree with him on, just have a listen to the talks. The beauty of this space and the beauty that I've learned from running, I never wanted to be a community leader or anything like that. But you find that you just gravitate towards this when you run associations because you want to learn and you find like minded people. But have a listen to people that are not in your space because you'll learn and end up figuring out like what are ways that things can be combined to create something new. So I see the future as being this combination of not just Web 2 and Web 3. You know, we don't talk about Web 2 anymore. It was only because Web 3 came about that now we have this reference back to Web 2. After, I, I remember it was like Web 2.0, Web 2.0, and I'm like to my friends when I wasn't in tech, what the F are you talking about? And they just laugh and giggle because that's what people did to Mark back then. But um, you, you find that you just stop talking about that because it was just the tech. It was just social media. And I think in a while we'll probably get to that stage as well. Um, but I, I just really believe that, you know, the future is going to be combined. Yeah, that reminds me of the time when I was at a large telecoms company beginning with T and we're having a conversation with somebody about Web 2.0, Web 2.0. And they said, we're not getting into porn. I don't know why Telstra would want to be in porn. <laughs> Could it be the American accent? Uh, Kate, what can't we do now that we might be able to do in the future with Web3? I don't know if I am qualified enough to speak beyond five years. I don't know if I've got the vision that Mark has. But I think, so I instantly, my mind turns to what can we do better um, than we can do today. And if I think about the problems that my children are going to face, um, one of those is definitely kind of access to owning your own home. And so I'm on a personal level right now really interested in the application of blockchain technology in transactions, property transactions, as you, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and I think that there's some really low hanging fruit there and some really big customer pain points that just need to be solved. And this smart contracts can help solve that, especially if you live in Tasmania and when you sell a house, you have to send for a paper copy of um, the title from Melbourne in order to bring it back to Tasmania. Anyway, you can get my pain at the moment. Um, but no, I think um, in the medium term, certainly by the time my children are starting to think about, you know, kind of getting on the property ladder, given that the forecast from, you know, the governor of um, uh, the RBA today was that, you know, property isn't going to go down because the supply issues are there. I think that access to home ownership is, is one of the things that will be enabled, I wouldn't say sold for, but enabled by this technology, whether that th is through kind of fractionalization um, or wh whatever it might be. But I think that something that affects all of us every day and will affect my children still um, is where I'll turn to um, for this technology to help solve. Fantastic. So a little practical advice for our 
for our followers here today. What applications, what Web3 applications should people be using today to make their lives better? Chat GPT. No. <laughs> Uh, no, be careful with ChatGPT because, you know, it does feed and learn off what you're saying, what, regardless of whether they deny it or not. I've run my own experiments to see that things that has never been fed into it that don't exist anywhere else in the net start popping up. So be very careful, but that doesn't mean that, I mean, Arthur and I were at a talk this morning, um, New South Wales. Here's the other thing. I'm touching on a few points just all together at once, everything, everywhere, so all of something. So you're just ignoring the question. Then. Correct. Uh, so... <laughs> I learned from him, so um, my colleagues, they're great. The, the interesting thing is that New South Wales government is actually really interested in this space. They've got a task force called the Data, Digital and AI Task Force, and digital being blockchain, and they're purposely keeping the word blockchain out of it because they um, you know, know that it is a, a buzzword that can be good or bad and stuff, so digital is the thing, but they're trying to create things in the space with sandboxes and experiments and conversations, so that's really good. Um, but what was the question here? <laughs> what applications in Web3 can people use today that will make their lives better uh, or more interesting? Yep, uh, definitely. If, if you don't want to invest, and some people are a bit afraid of that at the moment because, and this is not financial advice, there are different ways that you can invest, there are apps for that, but um, if you just want to learn in this space, there are actual tools out there that incentivize you to learn, right? Um, if you want to learn to be a developer, um, you can go to YouTube, for example, and learn how to code up smart contracts and actually build a website in React and have your first test bit of Ethereum that's sent back and forth. Coming to uh, things like Rabbit Hole, so look up Rabbit Hole, that is a place where you can get paid to learn. There are other platforms out there like that, but if you want to learn about any of those tools, depending on where you're coming in from, because if your interest is analytics, you want to talk to the chain analysis people in the room, if you want to you know, come in from a developer angle, you want to, whatever those things are, there are definitely tools out there that people in our Discord and OzDefi are talking about, but I would say the first and foremost tools are Discord and Twitter, even though Twitter is a bit of a, can I swear, shit yes. fight? It's a bit of a shit fight, sorry. Um, but there are gems in there, and I think in this blockchain space, the way that you learn is by having aha moments, and one of those first aha moments was looking at an economist's tweet thread talking about how they understood blockchain. And so learning tools, I would say it's going to be Discord and Twitter to start off with. Okay, any ideas? Um, I think um, my philosophy is learn by doing, so don't just read about the theory, actually participate. And of course, this is not financial advice, by the way, but of course, one of the ways to participate is in some of the financial um, apps that are out there. And I don't think anyone wants to hear from a 46-year-old Tasmanian what apps are good, because frankly, I probably don't know. So I canvassed my team before coming here, um, and the overwhelming... Um, answer from them was Aave. Um, and that's from a number of different fronts. For, firstly, in terms of the way Aave organizes, um, it operates as a DAO, um, as Mark mentioned earlier. So starting to get under the skin of the decentralized governance mechanisms, I think is really interesting. Um, but then there's also opportunities for you to test in a very low key way um, some of the investment potential of this space. Um, and it's interesting the extent to which one really pays attention when you've got, you know, a bit of your money there. It only has to be, you know, kind of $10 or whatever um, converted into um, a cryptocurrency and you see it start to perform that you start to get really interested and you start to really learn. So um, that's the top tip from the cool kids at NAB. Can I Not say from me. On, on that note, Aave and there's other apps out there very similar, these DeFi apps that aren't centralized means a business is running. A DeFi means a bit of code and groups that vote. It's still people, but they vote on it. They're the ones that are running it. Um, but Aave, Uniswap, SushiSwap, Uniswap being the one of the biggest ones out there. When we had the crises going on, crises, crises, whatever, um, they were the ones that did not fail. So FTX, Three Arrows Capital, Voyager were all centralized, and you, we, we are seeing them go through courts, and Sam Bagman frieds in jail or under parental jail or whatever it is now. Um, but those things are courts and arbitration, and it takes time, whereas with DeFi, if a trade goes bad or if an entity um, doesn't work, they hit their thresholds, things are paid back in the code that was already agreed upon by all the users coming in. There is none of this, like, uh, you know... Um, the crap that we have in a non-DeFi world. 
you get all that? There's a replay, so yeah. it's all good. <laughs> so, look, we're going to wrap up this part of the, the session today, and we're going to go into some questions first. But, but I think just to recap a little bit, or to, to, more to summarize, uh, there's a, a tremendous amount of potential out there. I think we all know that. I think that's why we're all here in the room. But there's also a lot more we don't know than we do know right now. And that poses both opportunity and risk. So it's going to be really interesting to see where this goes. But that's exactly why we created the Web3 Innovation Center, because we don't know where it is. You just heard from two people who have spent years in the space who don't have all the answers. And I certainly don't have all the answers. And I don't, all of you have all the answers. But if we put our heads together and we come together and, and we collectively start to solve some of these problems, address some of these risks, address some of the biases that go into these things, I think it's going to be a really exciting time because more heads are always better than one. So with that, I want to say thank you to our panelists, but also ask you to give them a quick round of applause. And now comes the hard part. Uh-oh. Now, we're just going to grab some questions from, from both the audiences online and hopefully some here as well. Uh, I'm just going to go in order, folks. Uh, and it, oh, it was the top voted question. Look at that. What advice can you give to the individuals here on how we can adapt to the paradigm shift brought by Web3 in order to remain competitive, innovative, and ahead of the status quo? Great question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, I, was, I was just going to say, you know, one of the biggest shifts that we had to make um, as startup founders is, oh my gosh, we have to be open with what we're building. Isn't that something like we're used to building in stealth up to 70 to 80% of the way and then opening up to the public. Now, when you look at the fact that Linux is open source and there's a company called Red Hat that monetizes off the top of that, you start to realize, and especially in this space because it's too small, we are not the majority, folks. Like Web3, blockchain, and even other emerging tech is still early stage. We need to actually bandy together, group together, and collaborate. And when you realize the bigger vision and how much bigger it is than your little idea and how much quicker you can get to market it really quickly and coming to meetups really quickly helps you overcome those fears of getting into this space and all of a sudden having that paradigm shift of like, I build in stealth. Everything he said, plus don't focus on the technology. It's really 101. I know it is. So sorry if I sound like a broken record and boring, but focus on the problem you're trying to solve. Oh. Because um, often people talk about blockchain as, as a as a nail looking for a hammer um, and actually I think that's an unfair um, analogy and so I think that one of the things we've done at NAB is really focus heavily on well, what other problems we're actually solving and every time we get um, you know challenges from internal stakeholders which happens every day if we bring the conversation back to well, what's the customer value and the problem we're solving then there's very little they can do to argue that. We regularly have the debate, is blockchain technology the right technology to solve that problem? Are we sure we're not just drinking our own Kool-Aid? Um, and sometimes we have to you know, face facts and, and dump a project because the reality is it isn't the right technology um, and we can solve it in another way. But definitely my advice will be just stick to the problem you're trying to solve. And then to Mark's point, absolutely go to the community um, to collaboratively solve it because um, we can't do it on our own. It's that Steve Jobs, you know, he doesn't say all about the tech. He says it's 10,000 songs in your pocket. Yeah. It's got to think about it that way. So, okay, a specific question for you, and you'll see why in a minute. No offense, Mark. Uh, we've been talking a lot about Web3 in the context, without even thinking about it, of large corporates for the most part or large organizations for the most part. But this is a nation of small businesses, primarily. So, Kate, what do you see as the Web3 blockchain highway for patent pending for small business across Australia in the next one, three, or five years? I think that, um, and we we kind of noodle this one a lot because we're quite nervous about the fact that the regulatory environment is fairly opaque. And so we're very nervous about encouraging our small business customers to participate in the space without those guardrails, because it is still a little bit Wild West. I would say the same for our retail customers. 
Um, and so we're not at the point where we're recommending or giving advice related to any of that. And so probably in a public forum, um, I couldn't kind of comment on the specifics of that. However, I'm really happy over a drink afterwards to share my own, ex no, 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 seriously, my own experiences. Um, I've been a small business owner myself. Um, my husband is a small business, well, was a small business owner until a week ago when he had to liquidate his company. And so I do have some strong personal views on um, some of the ways that I think this technology could help. Um, and happy to talk about that afterwards. You can answer too. Hey, there we go. <laughs> oh, such a relief. Um, you know, it's really interesting in chat GPT. <laughs> no, honestly. I regret it immediately. No, so um, people that ask chat GPT, how do I code this? I want to download data into Python with scripts from Yahoo Finance. And then they try out the code that comes out of it and it errors. Then they feed that error back into chat GPT and it gives them the fix eventually, right? Now, taking that same kind of concept here, by fast speed running, basically, uh, innovation, what we're effectively finding is that blockchain uh, helps us to get to the solution if it's not the solution. And what I'm saying here is that there are these businesses that, for example, uh, you know, they are afraid to come into this space, even though they've got this great blockchain type idea, because the regulatory rails aren't exactly clear just yet. But with using blockchain tech to effectively have a wrapper around these tokens, and this is the layer C thing we're working on, I'm not saying it is the solution, but it could be, um, is we're using blockchain tech to effectively imbue these existing tokens and new tokens with the regulatory rails that exist right now. So if you've got something that looks and smells and quacks like a financial security and you're just trying to get licensed but you don't think you can because, you know, there's things in the way, you don't think crypto is really regulated just yet, well, you can have these token wrappers that effectively make sure that you, in many ways, will likely not get in trouble with ASIC because it is just a security. Um, so we, we can use the tools at hand to help us solve these problems that are, that are challenges here. Um, and there may be other ways to do it with other tools. If we put that in plain speak and we think about your use case for the CBDC pilot, yep. what problem are you solving for construction firms? The fact that construction firms have these payments and these really long delays with payments after they've done the work and expect to invoice after 30 days and they don't get any payments and eventually um, down the supply chain get liquidated and can't pay their subcontractors and those subcontractors have families, etc., etc. And by having something that is transparent up front where value doesn't exchange in terms of the work being done and a subcontractor won't buy the raw materials until they know the other side has collateral. We're solving for that. We're using the CBDC actually in a very light way. It's there as a proof of reserve. We've got a stable coin, and you can look up what that is, um, a stable coin that effectively is like the Aussie dollar, and the CBDC is there to prove that that Aussie dollar is one-to-one -one backed with Aussie dollars, right? Uh, so we're trying to use the core tenets of blockchain to enable a better commercial transaction within the construction space. I didn't say this, but would you sum it up in one word as maybe cash flow? Yeah, cash cash flow is, oh, that, that is one word, yes. <laughs> cash flow. The lifeblood of most small businesses. Absolutely. Right. So it strikes me that if we had this conversation 18 months ago, it would have been a very different conversation. We would have been talking primarily about crypto. And we barely touched on it, right? And, and we barely touched on the metaverse and we barely touched on there's so much more we can talk about but i do want to ask probably one last question around crypto and cryptocurrency in general is a uh an issue that has plagued the web3 community in a way that's damaged the reputation what went wrong and what could be done better is there a future for crypto and how do we get there? Shall I go in? Just go on, then. You go first. Just, a, just that. Uh, crypto needed to use crypto technology, ironically. If things like FTX had just been more transparent and had been using, or for example, we had all of these ICOs that were out there a few years ago, um, initial coin offerings similar to companies, right, when they IPO. Um, 
things were happening there with the ICOs where basically you had uh, groups that were promising things to investors and it was just based on promises and when they'd raise the funds, they didn't uh, follow through with that. Now, if those things were written into the smart contracts and codified, yes, there's legal ramifications there, but it also means that there's less likelihood of people breaking their promises. So if crypto had only used crypto, we wouldn't be in the uh, the craziness that we're seeing right now. But in some way, maybe it is a bit of a blessing in disguise because we're stronger now. Uh, and yeah, I, I think it's uh, something that uh, could be a blessing. Yeah, I think um, governance, I hate to be so dull and boring and end on this note, but governance and regulatory guidelines will really help. It will provide some certainty to the market and it will ho hopefully, you know, kind of dispel some of the bad actors that are giving the industry overall a bad name. Um, let's not forget, though, you know, 18 months prior, we were riding high um, on the success of cryptocurrencies and everyone, man, this dog was jumping in. So it, it goes and swings and roundabouts, right? Um, and I think now it, this is the growing pains of a maturing sector that um, is learning from the mistakes of the last, well, it's longer than 18 months because some of those were systemic to those companies. Um, but I think that you know, as long as we take the learnings forward, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater um, and, you know, kind of keep grounding it in what problem are we really trying to solve. Um, I think we'll see, you know, enthusiasm come again, albeit in a more responsible way. Can I get another set of applause for our <laughs> panel? If there's... If there's other questions, like we'll be outside here, but also we can discuss these things online as well. Um, so I'll, I'll, if anyone wants to talk about the Discord where these ongoing chats happen, we'll, we'll talk about that. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, everybody, for coming. I just want to say a few things just to wrap up. Again, thank you to the, to the panelists. What an amazing time. I hope this has been both interesting, a little bit entertaining, and a lot informative. A lot of informativeness. Wow, that was bad. It's a word. It is now. Uh, and I hope that you understand that this is just the beginning of, of the journey with Web3, but also the Web3 Innovation Center. There's lots more to explore and delve into as we move forward. This is also not the end of the road in terms of these event series. So I know you're all Web3 enthusiasts, but I think we heard enough about AI today to recognize that that's a huge correlation with uh, with Web3 technologies. And so our next event, as I mentioned earlier in July, will, all, will be about AI and really interested in, in getting you all to come back and, and bring some friends to talk a little bit about AI and what that's going to mean for the world. It is the buzzword right now. Let's see if it still is in July. So we hope you do turn in, tune in for that. You can come again in person or again join online as you have before. Now we want to, we've opened the doors. We have some drinks. We have some food. If you're online, go have a drink. Go have some food. Join us. Join us on Discord, join us in the hubs, and once again, thanks everybody for your time today.